When she was 12 years old, she told her family she wanted to be an actress. They asked to see what she could do, so she let out a blood-curdling scream. <whistles> One year later, she started smoking cigarettes. First, she was Shirley Grossman, then Shirley Grayson. But like an old army buddy, her husband, the writer Sam Hall, would call her Grayson. So she became Grayson Hall. They moved into the Wyoming building in New York, which was rumored to be the inspiration for Rosemary's baby. She painted the walls red and filled it with an Adams Family-like assortment of valuable antiques and junk. By 1967, neither one of them could find work, and they had a son to take care of. So they were going to give up their dreams and move to Ohio, where Sam could work in his family's rubber glove factory. Then right as Grayson was about to step into the shower, the phone rang. She debated for a moment, but decided to answer. It was for a 13-week contract to play a doctor on a soap opera about a vampire. Grayson said, about a what? But accepted. Her character, Dr. Julia Hoffman, runs Wingcliff Sanitarium, and through treating his victim, learns the secret of Barnabas Collins and wants to cure him. Originally, Barnabas was going to throw her into a vat of acid, but fans and creator-producer Dan Curtis loved her. Not only did she stay on for the rest of the series, but aside from Jonathan Frid, she appeared in more episodes than any other actor or actress. After a few months in, Grayson threw a party to celebrate the end of an actor strike, where she knew that Sam and Dan would meet. And along with Gordon Russell, Sam became the main writer of Dark Shadows. And after school, the studio, and especially the awe-inspiring control room, became the perfect babysitter for their son, Matt. Altogether, she played six different characters on Dark Shadows. But get ready for your sedative, because we're talking about the top five episodes that spotlight her most famous one, Dr. Julia Hoffman. <laughs> Number 5, Episode 1036 Ellen Ripley of the Alien franchise is known as one of the strongest women in horror, but her predecessor was Dr. Julia Hoffman. As a genre, classic horror tends to be filled with damsels in distress, but Julia slapped a witch in the face. She went up against Satan's right-hand man, Nicholas Blair, and in this episode, which is set in the world of parallel time? Just as the other version of Julia Hoffman is about to stake Barnabas, our Julia unexpectedly appears and kills her own double with a fire poker. Julia? You're Dr. Julia Hoffman. I didn't want to kill her. I only wanted to stop her. Well, pardon me if I'm not sorry, eh? But if I had lived in this time, this would have been me. I don't understand it, but it feels very strange. Her name was Hoffman, too. Julia Hoffman. Now, we don't know that our Julia is in parallel time yet, so you were on the edge of your seat wondering, how is Barnabas going to get out of this? And out of nowhere, our Julia just appears and whacks her double! So it is such an exciting surprise, and visually it's unforgettable. Like other soaps of this era, Dark Shadows was filmed on a process called Live on Tape, where you film straight through like a live show, no stopping, no post-editing, but then it's broadcast later. And no other soap opera would have even attempted this kind of green screen effect but Dark Shadows. It's a brief moment when you see the two Hoffmans together, but that's how you do it. Because you're so wrapped up in the emotion, you don't have time to study it for flaws. A few minutes later, Julia decides she's going to pose as Hoffman the housekeeper to learn the secret of Angelique's supernatural plans. You may be a witch, Angelique, but Julia's got hair tougher than you. Number 4, Episode 361, or as fans call it, the Julia Episode. Seeking revenge, 
Barnabas causes Julia to have a series of terrifying hallucinations in the hopes that she will lose her mind. Carolyn Stoddard and Sarah Collins are in it a little, but this episode is really Grayson's one-woman show, and no one could have done it like her. Because the old-fashioned spooky special effects, combined with her over-the-top reactions, make it feel like a campy horror funhouse. Horror stars are always theatrical. Jonathan had an air of a Shakespeare play, and Grayson had this aura of a Betty Davis or Tula Bankhead, larger than life, deep voice, smoked cigarettes, and tough as nails. But unlike Davis and Bankhead, on a five-show-a-week soap opera, Grayson didn't have time to perfect her performance. The night before, Jonathan would come over for dinner, she'd usually make something French, maybe even her famous escargot, and they'd rehearse while she was chopping the vegetables. And sometimes, he would mess up his lines, and she would overact. And this is a solid 20 minutes of it. It's gonna storm, I better get out of here. Blood oozing from the wall. Where is it coming from? What does it mean? I've got to get out of here. I've got to get out. Let me out. Let me out. On one hand, it adds to her bizarre aura, which is perfect for horror. But on the other, these imperfections make her feel less like a star and more like a real person. And darling, I care about her more than I do to Lula Bankhead or Betty Davis. I laugh so much at her overdone facial expressions and masculine screams, but I feel like I'm laughing with her. Number three, episode 295. And good news, this is their first episode in color. Julia's patient, Maggie Evans, who is suffering from amnesia, has escaped from Wincliffe Sanitarium and is starting to remember everything, including when Barnabas held her captive. So Julia hypnotizes Maggie so that she will permanently forget about being his prisoner. I think it's a combination of her unusual acting style, her high cheekbones, pale skin, and those big eyes. But there is something spooky about Grayson Hall, and this is her most chilling performance. As the show develops, both Barnabas and Julia would become the heroes, but originally, she is the sinister mad scientist who is willing to sacrifice Maggie's mind for the sake of her experiment. Now, Dr. Woodard thinks her manner and methods are a little strange, but both him and Maggie Evans completely trust her intentions. Just as Maggie is starting to remember Barnabas, Julia comes into the room and tells her to stop, and you see that flash of her inner coldness. Then she goes back to pretending to care and politely asks Dr. Woodard to leave the room. Don't say another word! What you must remember, you must remember in the proper order. Otherwise you could go back to the way you were when you were found. Now tell me, Maggie, what it is you really actually remember. I remember everything. I remember a cemetery. I remember being put in a coffin and being locked in a room. Now, who was it that held you prisoner? It was Barnabas Collins. Are you quite sure? I'm positive. It was horrible. Almost beyond belief. He's some kind of a creature from the world of the dead. He's not alive! Do you believe me? I believe everything you say. Now we must bring you back to normalcy. To the good life you had before all of this happened. And the first thing we must do is stabilize your memory. That's right, keep looking at it, and listen to my voice. Don't listen to anything else. Because within my voice, you will find everything you've been seeking. Everything. You could tell by the blasé tone in her voice that she's no longer interested in Maggie. And while Dr. Woodard is trying to figure out what happened, she gives this unforgettable sly smile. This episode also introduces us to Julia's signature medallion. And like Barnabas's cane, it's an extension of her personality, glamorous yet mysterious. Later on, the hypnosis scenes will become more elaborate, but there's something so real 
and so eerie about how she just casually pulls it out from under her jacket and attracts Maggie's attention with it just enough to manipulate her mind. Number 2, Episode 290 After seeing him in his coffin, Julia concludes that Barnabas is a vampire. While they're discussing the Collins family history, she implies that she knows it. Later, Barnabas goes to her bedroom to kill her, but Julia is the one waiting for him. Dan loved Dracula, and originally this was going to be their version of Professor Van Helsing, Dr. Julian Hoffman. Dr. Woodard even refers to this character as one of the best men in the field. But there was a typo in one of the scripts. And instead of Julian, it said Julia, and Dan was inspired figured no one would remember what Woodard said and changed the character to a woman. In Dracula, Bela Lugosi and Edward Van Sloan will engage in these verbal battles, but with Grayson and Jonathan, it takes on a sexual tension and a wittiness, as if they are the Cary Grant and Katherine Hepburn of horror. Perhaps I've uncovered something you're unfamiliar with. I find Barnabas Collins, oh not you of course, to be the most fascinating of all the Collinses. How can you? He went to England when he was very young, and died there almost obscurely. Or so the story goes. You mean you've uncovered some new facts? I told you when I first met you. I know a great deal about a great many things. I can't believe you found out anything truly startling. Maybe I have, and maybe I haven't. May I ask what you have discovered? If you remember at the time, I offered you an exchange of information. I would tell you everything I know, and you would tell me everything you know. You refused. If you are willing, perhaps we could talk tomorrow, at my place. I would like that very much. Shall we say, tomorrow morning? I'm afraid that wouldn't be convenient. Oh, well, tomorrow afternoon then. I won't be available until the evening. I understand. Completely. As a vampire, Barnabas is all-powerful, but with Grayson playing her, so is Julia. Once the actor Roger Davis tried to step over her marks so that the camera would be more on him, so as hard as she could, she stepped on his foot and said never do that again. Another time, one of the kids hanging out outside the studio was trying to peek into her dressing room, so she went down there and demanded he apologize. So even though Barnabas is a vampire, they feel like equals. And as much as Jonathan's inner kindness shines through in his Barnabas, Grayson's charisma shines through in her Julia. She was the life of the party on that set. Cast, crew, and fans just gravitated towards her. And it is so much fun to see her consistently outsmart him. At the beginning of the episode, she is the first character to see Barnabas in his coffin and walk away. And at the end, she is the first character to leave him speechless. Good evening, Barnabas Collins. I've been waiting for you for a long time. A very long time. Number 1, Episode 1070. This episode is an epic and atmospheric horror love story with Collinwood and Barnabas and Julia in their most desperate hour. Barnabas and Julia have gone to the future, the year 1995, and have found that Collinwood is in ruin and inhabited by the evil spirit of Gerard Stiles. Possessed, Julia betrays Barnabas to the sheriff and he barely escapes being shot by silver bullets. But he won't go back to 1970 without her. He faces Gerard, and they go through the stairway into time together. Three years before Dark Shadows, the relatively unknown Grayson Hall got an Oscar nomination for playing the repressed lesbian Miss Fellows in Night of the Iguana. She was an intelligent and creative actress. When she first got the role of Julia, in her words, she thought the character was a straight ass and needed to be more interesting. So without consulting Dan or the writers, purely for her performance, she created a whole backstory and the motivation that she was in love with Barnabas. But of course, he was always after the younger girls. 
Fans who also loved Barnabas and couldn't have him connected to Julia. Grayson's mother told her, Nothing you have ever done has touched people the way Dark Shadows has. And this is her most impactful moment. You betrayed me. You told the sheriff. I will, Barnabas. I will betray you over and over. You're not safe with me. <laughs> don't tell me anything. And don't ask me to go with you anywhere. Go to Angelique's room. Lock the door. Hope you can get back before. Before what, Julia? It will be back. And if you escape them, when dawn comes, you will come to my coffin to kill me. Oh, Julia, who has saved me so often, what has he done to you? Don't, don't talk about him, Barnabas! Just go while you can! Then it will be my will against his. Look at me, Julia. You hear my voice. You will do as I say. Now look at me! You can escape. Not without you. You can't take me with you. Never without you. The writers would allude to it here and there, but over the course of the show, their bond was something that was mainly just felt, and it made it more powerful. Early on, Barnabas would say to Julia, You betrayed me! And be filled with rage. But here he says it with concern for her, as he realizes how much he has grown to trust her, and how much she means to him. And it feels so good, and you feel so happy for her when he finally holds her and tells her everything is going to be okay. He never tells her I love you, but this is as close as he gets. Before they can return to 1970, they must have what else? A seance, where the spirit of Carolyn speaks through Julia, and they learn the six clues that will lead to the destruction of Collinwood. Barnabas and Julia know they'll be facing something terrifying, and they must depend on each other more than ever before. Are you Carolyn? Oh, Barnabas. Barnabas. Yes, I am Carolyn. You must tell us what the six clues mean. We have to know what they mean. The picnic. The night of the sun and the moon. The murder. The unfinished horoscope. <laughs> the night I sang my song. Rose Cottage. For four years, the Halls were a Dark Shadows family. They talk about it at the dinner table. Most of their friends were Dark Shadows people. And their son Matt would never forget when the makeup man turned him into a werewolf and sent him out to scare the school kids. When Dark Shadows was cancelled, Grayson said, I don't know what everyone here is so glum about. Everyone here is only losing one paycheck. I'm losing two. But after Dark Shadows, Grayson and Sam never had to worry about being unemployed again. Grayson did mostly theater with some TV, and Sam won an Emmy for writing One Life to Live. And both Sam and Matt worked together on the 1991 Dark Shadows revival series. To keep up with her enormous fan mail, Grayson gave two of her teenage fans $75 to start the Grayson Hall Fan Club. She would take part in studio tours and would even invite some of her teenage fans to her apartment. Typical for Grayson, she would have Sam make them scotch and water. Grayson died in 1985 and was unable to attend any Dark Shadows conventions. But Jonathan Fred mentioned how much fun he thought they would have had. Grayson is still well loved in the Dark Shadows community. And when I went to the Dark Shadows convention, not only was there a drag queen version of Julia, but whenever they would show clips of Grayson, the audience would burst into applause. Dark Shadows is my favorite show because there's nothing else like it. And there's no other actress like Grayson Hall. She makes you believe these crazy situations. And just as much as Jonathan Frid, she is the spirit of the show. 